it's uh, lovely to at least uh, see some of my friends and colleagues in Diatom World, at least remotely. I haven't seen any of you probably in three years, but hopefully uh, that can change as we slowly get back to normal. Uh, and also, uh, thank you very much for the invite. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that, you know, um, the, I'm going to, I'm the one presenting it. So my name's sort of on the top here, but uh, uh, very few of the profiles are, are really counted or uh, interpreted by me. Uh, I have a very, very, very great group of uh, limnologists and paleo limnologists in our group, especially about more than half of them working on diatoms. We work on a wide spectrum of paleo indicators, but diatoms have always been the key. And for this talk, especially uh, Dr. Kathleen Ruland, who is a research scientist in my group, and Dr. Neil McCaluti, uh, really played key roles in some of the, especially the new analysis that I'll be talking in the second half, which is with these Northern Great Lakes, which was something that was still missing in our understanding, I think, of Great Lakes. Uh, Sarah kindly in, invited me to this talk when my book came out a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bit of perhaps self-promotion. I just point out I get absolutely no royalties. It's published by a not-for-profit. <laughs> but uh, chapter four of this new book was on, uh, it, this is a very strange book in some ways. It's published by the <clears throat> International Ecology Institute. And it comes from the International Ecology Institute Prize. And one aspect of the prize is they ask you, or one could say they expect you to write a book in their book series, which at times I was wondering, was this really a prize? But <laughs> but it was a good thing for me to do, I think. And it's part memoir and part uh, science book. Uh, it's mainly about why we did things, what was the sequence, and who did we meet? So it's it really is a much more personal account. It's 13 chapters, and almost all of them are based on diatoms. But chapter four is The Power of Ice, Arctic Lakes on the Front Line of Climate Change. And it's a retrospective of how we came about to some of these ideas and some of the work we did and the controversies we faced uh, doing that work. Uh, and so, so the first part is a sim summary of how we got to where we were. And the really new stuff is at the very end where we talk about the great so-called Arctic Great Lakes. <clears throat> My uh, Arctic adventures began, I just, just realized 40 years ago, I started very young. I was very young when I started, but, uh, <laughs> But it is 40 years ago, 1983, I had the opportunity to go up with West Blake uh, to the high Arctic, uh, to Ellesmere Island, which at, which at that time was very hard to get to, still very hard to get to. And uh, I met Wes at a scientific meeting. I would have you know, been in the early 20s. Uh, I, he, I gave a talk. He seemed quite interested in what I was doing. He was a glaciologist, but he was taking lake sediment cores to track when the glaciers left. He was using the basal dates. He says, well, I have these cores. And so I got the opportunity to go, and I'm going to start the, the, the story from where we did a, a lot of our work, which is Cape Herschel, up here on Ellesmere Island. Getting to Cape Herschel, one of the reasons we have so little data in the high Arctic is very hard to get to. It's much easier now than it was 40 years ago. But basically, to get to Cape Herschel, I live in Kingston, Ontario, here on Lake Ontario. We'd go to Ottawa, then we take a, a jet to Iqaluit, which is the... Uh, the capital of um, of Nunavut territory, and that's about a three four hour flight. That would be a jet. Then we take a much smaller plane, maybe five or six hours, get to Resolute Bay. Then Resolute Bay, we that's where our equipment is stored. Then we take a twin otter up to Alexander Fjord. Then we take a helicopter to Cape Herschel, and then we'd walk. So uh, this these are some of the reasons that it's very hard to do this kind of work, but. We are going to the most sensitive parts of the world for climate change, even though at the beginning, it wasn't really looking at climate change. It was really just trying to find out what's in these lakes. Canada, about half of Canada is Arctic. Most Canadians don't think of it that way, but about half of Canada is Arctic. And certainly 40 years ago, we knew virtually nothing about Arctic lakes and especially high Arctic lakes. When I, this is Cape Herschel. So I show this because, um, this is like in late summer, and also, this is also more recent because you can see there's only a little bit of snow, but this would be an August shot. Uh, so there's been, there's been quite a few papers from Cape Herschel now, not just on diatoms, but limnology. And I think sometimes people have an idea of this relatively large field station, you know, people, you know, bringing in planes like this. We No, uh, Cape Herschel is a hut where you run to if you see polar bears, and the rest is tents. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, most of the people... Uh, sleep in tents, but we have one hut that's a cooking tent over here. So it is very rustic uh, procedures. Uh, however, uh, it is a beautiful place and an ideal location for me to have gone as a very young man, uh, trying to sort out what was there. 
uh, like much of the Arctic for that very short summer. So we're up almost 80 degrees north here. It's midnight, noon, same amount of daylight. You know, or you can't tell if it's midnight or noon. Uh, high Arctic, highly sensitive. And a remarkable place to do this kind of work was this is Cape Herschel from a helicopter. And this is the, the map we used in the Douglas and Small Papers. We divided them up. But there are about 38 major ponds, uh, including, you know, some are fairly larger lake size. This is almost a kilometer long, different sizes. Also an elevation gradient, which at this high Arctic, even that 300 meters or so is enough to cause significant changes in ice cover. And when I landed there, we knew very, very little about what was going on. And my first part was just to catalog what was there, what was the limnology and what was living in these lakes and ponds. And even though it's a, a, a small cape of just a few kilometers, <clears throat> it's remarkable the diversity of ponds, even within that small area. Part of it's an elevation gradient. Very quickly, even in August, you get to a quite a bit colder sites on the top of the plateau. Uh, you can have like Camp Pond down here, Call Pond, always the first to open up. There were real differences in these ponds that uh, we could learn and study. And of course, this is all done with a very dedicated group of graduate students and, uh, and other colleagues uh, to work on that. Now, I went there as a young guy, <clears throat> and partly because of the gradients and partly was it we weren't just working on Cape Herschel. Thankfully, Wes Blake was a glaciologist at the Geological Survey of Canada, who was in charge of this small group of six people, had a had a access to a lot of helicopter time. And that may I mean we could not just stay at Cape Herschel, though we studied that extensively. We for over the two months I was there, we were able to move around and fly to a large number of different lakes. And the first thing that hit me as a young guy was the power of ice. Here we are depending where you are, going up even a small elevation gradient, you would have strikingly different ice and snow covers. The deep lakes will be, at this point, almost permanently ice covered. And talk, I'm talking two or three meters of ice plus snow. The shallower sites, like the ponds, would open up totally. Even on the ponds, going up an elevation gradient, there'd be still significant differences. And I'm thinking, and this is actually, <laughs> this is going back to my PhD thesis figure and what published in 1988. But even then I was looking and I said, ice cover, thinking of it as a blanket is completely, here's the same lake under three climate scenarios, cold, medium, and warm. These, it's the same lake, same lake water, but drastically different habitat for diatoms. And this is where I worked on, you know, we hear a lot about lake ice, but we didn't hear much about 40 years ago. We hear a lot about sea ice, but not so much about lake ice. And I was reasoning, surely this must be reflected, not just in the diatoms, but the other indicators we use, cladoscar, coronamids, so on, that these are dr drastically different limnological conditions. And uh, that's really what I worked on. And uh, when we took our first cores, and I was there in 83, the took our, when we finally analyzed the first cores, which came a decade later, the first cores we published, uh, we saw striking changes and we, we aimed high. <laughs> we went to science with it and it got accepted. Uh, these are the first three profiles we showed from Cape, Cape Herschel. Uh, and what we showed, and this is the work of Marianne Douglas, part of her PhD thesis, as, who many of you know, I'm sure, um, went on to be professor at University of Toronto, then director of the Arctic Center at University of Alberta. Uh, and what we showed were these striking changes in the surface sediments after thousands of years of relative complacency in different types of lakes. These are the three profiles in that science paper we showed striking changes. The only way we could interpret those changes is warming. And so uh, we we uh, we published that paper uh, uh, in science. You know, you're, you're a young person. I was in my 30s at this stage. Uh, Marianne would have been in her 20s. You know, you feel good. You got a paper in science. And uh, that, that lasted for about a week. Uh, well, we still felt good about it. But Pretty soon we had this feeling that the only one who believed what was in our paper was ourselves, the science editor and the three journal reviewers, because we got a lot of questions about what this actually was and was it climate related and was it ice related? Well, that's where the story in some ways begins. Uh, I should point out, um, you know, people, it's funny how people are, they remember the 1994 science paper, uh, but it's very easy to forget that at that point I had 11 years of basic taxonomic and ecological research on these same ponds. Uh, we spent over a decade documenting the taxonomy and ecology of these communities before the 1994 science paper. It wasn't like some people suggested, and I'm almost quoting word for word, pull this out of, the, out of our hats. 
uh, it was based on, a, I believe, a very firm foundation of what actually lives in different environments, different lake systems, different ice covers, and then we applied it to the sediment cores. Now, here we are in the high Arctic, and we're dealing with ponds at this stage, shallow sites. Uh, and what we said, and this is, uh, we basically, this is our, some of the drawings of the late John Glue, who many of you also know. But what we were saying is before the most recent warming, uh, it was the lakes were just so frequently ice covered that all you had were these rock and sand associated benthic taxa. It was only with warming, which we call condition two, where there was enough open water time that you actually got mosses growing. You actually got at some aquatic grasses growing. You diversified the habitat. And that's why we had this explosion of diversity in the most recent sediments. Now, it's a bit of an anachronism to say, you know, surely that's not nothing new. In 1994, to keep in mind a few things, it's a bit of an anachronism to think about it. Say, of course, it's climate, you know, climate. I mean, everyone talks about post 1850 climate warming now. It was kind of a new thing to say that 30 years ago. 30 years ago, climate warming was not yet on the, uh, really on the wavelengths of many people. And also we were saying it's already happened. Uh, people were talking about climate warming happening. Now we were on shallow ponds. We chose the most sensitive sites to this cores on and in the most sensitive part of the world, the high Arctic because of all the albedo issues. So, but I think it, it's a bit of an anachronism to think, well, yeah, what was the problem? Everyone believes that. Well, it was a little different 30 years ago. <laughs> now that's just the, how the story starts. Uh, we were the concluding paragraph of the Douglas et al. paper was given the absence of comparable paleological studies from other high latitude ponds, we cannot yet determine how widespread these changes have been. So, what we started, we started extensively increasing our geographic focus. Now, we go about every third year back to the Cape Herschel ponds, these are very well studied ponds, we got to know them very well. Uh, but as we, we moved about every yeah, in between those two years. We did similar types of sampling throughout the high Arctic. Here are just some of the sites. These are figures from the text from the book I just spoke of, where I summarize a lot of this information. Uh, these are just from some of them, really going over a very wide spectrum of different limnological settings, uh, different types of uh, chemistry, different types of nutrient conditions. For example, things like Banks Island or uh, <clears throat> Bathurst, uh, Bathurst Island those naturally had much higher nitrogen and phosphorus levels because of the soils and stuff. Some like Isaacson uh, in, in the, um, uh, near uh, Elif Ringness Island up here, uh, they were more acid. They were very, very different types of lakes, very different types of ponds. Uh, and yet we could show the same types of patterns happening with warming. And we extended this not just in the high Arctic islands, but we went, as I'll show you in a bit, certainly down into the subarctic of Canada through Alaska, and in fact, we went uh, uh, circumpolar. We have like four years of data with my students um, in various parts of the former, uh, well, Siberia, basically, uh, throughout uh, parts of Greenland, Iceland, um, uh, Arctic Scandinavia. And so we really move these studies on a broad geographic focus. So, and when you go to a lot of sites, you see a lot of things. And that, I think, is key. We we could still see different patterns, but still obviously different diatom species and different groups, but the same types of patterns linked to ice cover. Um, and I'm going to take you, so let's see, you had, you had some luck going for you too. Uh, for example, we were trying to show that it was, ice was the dominant factor. And there were other competing hypotheses as to why we're seeing these changes. Some of them uh, very strongly expressed, let me say. Uh, but we were convinced after all this work that we were we were on the right track. And I'm going to take you up here on northern Ellesmere Island near Lake Hazen, uh, where by just show you how sometimes by luck you can do things. Uh, this is uh, near Lake Hazen. Uh, so we're up at about 82 degrees north now, and 82, 83 in this area. Uh, and uh, um, uh, what we found in this example, just show you one example, we have uh, two ponds side by side. One of them is in the shadow of mountains. The other one is not. Throughout the summer, this one persists with an ice cover. This pond doesn't have an ice cover. Uh, they're about the same depth. They're about 20 centimeters difference in depth. Uh, and they have identical, essentially identical water. The only thing different is the temperature, but they have essentially identical water chemistry. Uh, they had like same nitrogen, same calcium, same pH, same everything. Uh, and yet, so we asked if, how if ice cover is a factor, 
if it was water chemistry, they'd have the identical diatom profiles. If it was ice cover, we would argue that Skelton Lake, which previous studies going back going back some years have shown consistently has this pers persisting ice cover, whereas uh, the other lake right next to it, in fact, they they're 20 meters apart. One actually drains into the other. So we're talking about essentially the same water body. But here we could do like a little, uh, to use as Ed Devey, the um, now deceased some, some decades, but wrote a paper, Coaxing History to Conduct Experiments. We looked at that and go, well, we should take a sediment core from here, a sediment core from here. We would predict highly different profiles. And sure enough, that's exactly what we got. I'm not going to go into any details. But sure enough, a complacent profile for the lake would ice cover, persist in ice cover, and certainly not on the other one. Uh, well, that was ponds. Um, we then said, okay, ponds, I think we have a pretty good handle on, on these, which, by the way, the most important water bodies in the Arctic, because they're, they're far more abundant than lakes. But even at Cape Herschel, I, we started looking at lakes going over to Pym Island. Uh, there was some relative deep lakes. Some of these have two or three meters of ice cover, even in and when I, in the 1980s, never lost their ice cover. They have now lost their ice cover, which we, uh, Katie Griffiths has shown uh, using paleo how that changes. Uh, but these were essentially almost permanently ice covered lakes, except for that shallow moat that I talked about in that first slide. And we argued that sure enough, that these should have quite a different diatom response. We had done a lot of work on these types of sites, which are essentially all littoral zone, some of the, you know, less than half a meter deep. Um, these types of lakes would be quite different. Um, ice cover would have a different effect on these lakes. Uh, we would be opening up the whole planktonic region. We would uh, uh, greatly expanding this moat where this, uh, if it's completely ice covered, almost completely ice covered, all you'd have available is this shallow moat. But with warming, you get more and more of this open water conditions. And again, to make a long story perhaps short, this is exactly what we were able to show. Uh, this is mainly the work of Kathleen Ruland in my lab, part of her PhD work and continuing on to work to the present day. Uh, this is just Slipper Lake. So I'm taking you now to the to the mainland of Canada uh, in the Northwest Territories. And uh, this is a highly, uh, highly um, um, uh, abbreviated profile, obviously, but this goes back about 4,000 years, 5,000 years. And sure enough, with warming, post-1850 warming, uh, we saw uh, an increase in things like Discostella stelligera uh, and other planktonic taxa, which is exactly what you would predict with the declining ice cover. And we can do this in detail, and we've done this in detail in a large number of lakes since then, but you can also do a shortcut, what we call the top-bottom approach, uh, look at the surface sediments, look at pre-1850 sediments, do this on a very large number of lakes, which we did here in this paper, going back uh, again about 20 years now. Uh, and uh, sure enough, we could we could show that if you look at the presents cyclotellas in the surface sediments, presents cyclotellas in the uh, pre-1850 sediments, and sure enough, you can see in almost every lake a shift from these benthic fragileroids that live in the moats to things that uh, require these open water conditions like these discostella species. And we've shown this in a large number of lakes. Now, not everyone increased in discostella. We never said they would. Uh, but these are typically other planktonic taxa. This is just all this, these small cyclotels, but these are other planktonic taxa that are also increasing in these environments. So you can show this on a regional, here's 50 lakes. You can show it on individual lakes and get at the timing. Uh, we move this away from the Arctic and many of you may know Kathleen's paper here <clears throat> that we did in 2008, where we looked at over 200 paleoluminological records and started showing that indeed, this is not just peculiar to the subarctic, uh, is less and less as you go farther south because the biggest changes are in the Arctic with warming as we'd expect. But we can show this going through, uh, if it's if it's non-acidified and non-enriched, these classic changes linked to changing ice cover. And what we're actually seeing <clears throat> is <clears throat> if you're in shallow environments, you're going from, uh, from these uh, little fragile aeroids with these extensive periods of ice cover, with less ice cover, you're allowing in these shallow sites far more uh, diverse littoral zone uh, assemblages. And this is not just in the diatoms, we can show this in other groups as well. Once you go to deeper, <clears throat> deeper lakes, if you start mixing, that cha completely changes. You know, if you have an ice cover, not only do you have reduced light, uh, re but you also have reduced mixing. Uh, and again, you get very, very different types of diatoms. And then when you add into this, uh, increased thermal stratification, it even pushes it further, especially to these small cycloteloids and related taxa. Uh, 
Now, <clears throat> you can still let history run experiments, and we did this over the years, and you can start making predictions. What there are, st there were still at least then, there are fewer now, there were at least then some lakes that were still per almost permanently ice covered. Um, and it, you say, if ice, if we're arguing ice cover and climate, and it wasn't the other factors that other people were stating are the major factors driving these assemblages, we would predict a muted response in diatom data of lakes that still support extensive ice cover. And back then, there still were some lakes, look, three or four meters of ice, even in August, like this is Grensfield. Uh, I took this picture on, uh, on part of Ellesmere Island. I'll take you to one lake where there was quite a bit of early work done, Char Lake on Res in Resolute Bay. Uh, it was chosen for two reasons. One, it's near Resolute Bay where we land. Uh, so it's relatively easy logistically. Look, we even have a truck here. That's it's near an air. It's near the last airport, which is still a gravel airport. Uh, but it's um, uh, we also had water chemistry data from the IBP years when uh, Char Lake was used in the IBP program in 1968 to 1972. However, this is what the lake still looked like in August, at least uh, some time ago. Still several meters of ice. We'd look at that and saying, you know, if changing ice cover is driving the assemblages we should have a relatively complacent diatom profile in these types of lakes. And sure enough, that's exactly what we did. Here's one of Neil Nicoludi's papers. Uh, this is uh, going back, now this core was taken in 1997. I'd like to go back now and take another core because with warming, this lake is now opening up, but uh, there's a subtle change at the surface. Uh, we're just starting to see this higher complexity here. Uh, we're uh, just starting to see these taxa come in. Uh, but, you know, this is still uh, a relatively, you know, complacent profile, which one would predict, given they're still even in midsummer, there's this big, big hunk of ice still sitting in the center of the lake, at least it was when we took the core. Well, <clears throat> by the time uh, we got a little later, other people were doing these same types of studies, not in Canada, well, some in Canada, but also around uh, around uh, the circumpolar Arctic. And we were at the Finnish uh, International Paleolinology Symposium where uh, we started realizing other people were starting to show kind of the same thing that we were showing, including people who argued early on that we weren't really showing climate, but they were starting, the papers were starting to show sort of similar things. We got together at that meeting, some of the PIs, and we ended up collecting 26 co-authors. Uh, and sometimes I'm thinking about writing a paper about writing a paper with 26 co-authors, but anyways, it went out pretty well. And Alex Wolf and I co-led a study uh, that we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what we had was about, throughout the circumpolar Arctic, we had about 40, or I forget, 40, 45 profiles, not just diatoms, mostly diatoms, of using high resolution techniques over the last 200 years and to see, do we see consistent patterns? And uh, that, uh, it went throughout the circumpolar Arctic. And sure enough, if you go to the Canadian high Arctic, oh, here's one of the profiles I showed you. That's one of Marianne Douglas's, these striking changes. Um, you know, and we have about 45 of these profiles. I'm just showing you some representatives. These striking changes in diatoms, which we indicated was climate warming. You go farther east in the Canadian high Arctic, these are more acid sites. Again, striking changes in the Canadian high Arctic. You go farther south as predicted um, because of less amplified, less Arctic amplification. Uh, we're still seeing striking changes, but not, not as big as here. Uh, but here, for example, on Baffin Island, the cyclotella is coming in, uh, go through the Northwest Territory, same thing. What about the European Arctic? Uh, let's go to the, uh, I'll come to, this is North and Quebec, I'll come to that uh, at the end here. Uh, what about the European High Arctic? Going like Svalbard, same types of things we see in the Canadian High Arctic, going farther south, going through the uh, uh, Scandinavian Arctic lakes, again, less and less uh, Arctic amplification, but still seeing these types of changes. And you can show that on a graph that we did and it all matched. And again, I'm just showing some representative profiles here. Now we also had a, over 10 profiles from Northern Quebec and around um, and other regions that did not show any changes. And um, uh, this was a imp very important part of the study. We had over 10 profiles from Northern Quebec. Uh, and th these cores were taken before 1995. They were taken mainly by Reinhard Pienitz, a former uh, PhD student of mine, as you know, a professor at University of Laval. Uh, and this was the one area, one of the few areas in the world, uh, one of the few areas in the world where um, um, 
where because of uh, ocean currents and Labrador current, we'll get into that maybe later, had not yet warmed. And this was an important control area, reference area. We had 10, 11 cores from the one part of the Canadian Arctic that hadn't warmed. Uh, and they were taken before the post-1995 warming. All, I think it was 11 profiles, showed exactly these types of profiles, complacent, not changing. And we showed it with Christ fight cysts. We showed it with other indicators as well. So that was, again, a pretty good control that it was climate that we were looking at. Now, I said they didn't warm until 1995. And that's got to do with the uh, with currents. And uh, there were two areas, northern uh, along the Labrador coast and in Hudson's Bay. And that was because these areas were still choked with ice. It was warming, but I think Hudson's Bay is this big bay. It was choked with ice. So the, the, it was still ice covered. Now, ice was thinning, but the ocean, the ocean in Hudson's Bay was still, still frozen over. Now, post-1995, that started changing and changing very fast. We passed the climate threshold. So we predicted in Arctic regions that have only very recently experienced warming, uh, we should see uh, bi strong biotic changes over the last few decades. Here's another paper by Kathleen Rowland where we looked at this from 2013. Uh, and we went to the Hudson's Bay lowlands. Uh, we had several lakes here. And it was considered like the last holdout to climate warming because of this ice-blocked uh, Hudson's Bay. But starting in 1995, things started changing. Well, sure enough, uh, so I'm going to show you, the, this is where we're going to go to. And sure enough, that's the, this is the climate record. It's very clear in the early 1990s, everything went nuts in Hudson's Bay. That's because, uh, you know, the ice started melting. Once the ice started melting, albedo and all the positive feedback started coming in. So we predicted if we went back to these lakes, and look, we said post 1990s, we should see the same types of changes we saw much earlier in the other lakes. And without going into great detail, we had several lakes, deep lakes, shallow lakes, they're showing exactly the same thing. Uh, sure enough, post 1990s, we're seeing these marked changes in diatom assemblages. Uh, for example, here I've got in, uh, uh, let's see, in, in, in red, I, sorry, in red I have temperature, in blue, I have the cyclotellas. Here I have blue, I have the diversity in the shallow site. These are shallow sites, these are deep sites. And you can see how closely they match. So I think we were pretty confident what we were doing. And since that time, you know, there's been a considerable amount of limnological and paleomological research uh, collected over the last 30 years on, on shallow ponds and a considerable amount on what I say, medium-sized ponds, but we knew very little about the really big ones partly because it's not the easiest things to core. And uh, one of my heroes, David Schindler, who died in 2021, he wrote a, an opinion paper in 2001. And he was talking to, it was published in Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. And he referred to it as a national disgrace, how little we knew about the Canadian Northern Great Lakes. Uh, and I would classify these as Lake Hazen, Great Bear, and Great Slave Lake. Well, we can't, these are the lakes, um, you know, these are the Great Lakes you all know, <laughs> but there's other sort of Great Lakes up here as well. Uh, we can't go back and resample these lakes going back 100 years or 50 years, but we can take sediment cores. So now I'm going to do some very recent work. Uh, this is the Lake Hazen work is mainly led, the diatom work is led by Neil McLeod in my lab. The Great Bear and Great Slave is mainly by Kathleen Ruland. Um, and I'm going to just to, before I get into what's changing, we these these are ice covered lakes. These have massive thermal inertia, and we would have predicted, just as we've done going from the shallow ponds to the medium sized ponds and going up mountains, these should be quite delayed in their response to climate warming because of their massive size. Um, and uh, we also they're strikingly different types of lakes. Uh, these are um, well, this one Lake Hazen's at eighty one. Uh, Great Bear is at the Arctic Circle. Great Slave is south of the Arctic Circle. These are very deep lakes. Great Slave is the deepest lake uh, in North America. Uh, most people think it's Superior or something. It's actually Great Slave. These are deep, deep lakes. Uh, and they're uh, very different lakes in many ways. Uh, look at this, you know, depending on glacier input, uh, Hazen it, without it is 8.3, but a lower when it, if the glacier is going, 30 in Great Bear, but Great Slave gets a lot of sediment from the Slave River, for example, it's quite different. Nutrients, basically distilled water in Hazen and Great Bear. Uh, 
uh, but significantly higher in Great Slave, again, getting nutrients from, from the Slave River. So very, very different links. So, but we would predict if ice cover is so important, we should see similar functional responses in these three very different lakes. The only thing in common is very deep uh, and, and in the Arctic. Let's start off with Lake Hazen. Again, Lake Hazen. Lake Hazen is up here about 81, 82 degrees north. Uh, if you have a globe on your desk, it's probably under the washer. You can't see it. <laughs> but again, uh, uh, it's cold monomictic, uh, extensive, still, still a lot of ice cover, but now it's opening up. And I've been going there long enough, I've actually seen some of these changes in ice cover, as have others. We also have, for some of these lakes, some historical data. Operation Hazen. Remember the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union, United States. They were going to send bombers. Where are they going to send those bombers? They're going to send them over Canada. So uh, there was ideas of putting meteorological, three or four meteorological uh, outfits so they can tell the bombers which where the, which route to take. And also they were they the, the Defense Department sent up people who was called Operation Hazen, and it became in the 1950s. Uh, part of the International Geophysical Year. And this was mainly led by Jeffrey Hatter Hatterley Smith, a young Hatterley Smith. He's, he died uh, about 10 years ago now. Uh, but we actually have some data right here on Lake Hazen. Look, at you can even see the ops, the ice cover here <laughs> on Lake Hazen. They're landing, uh, they're landing planes on it. Uh, you're not going to do that now, I can assure you, uh, in summary. Uh, but we looked at that. And this was a paper published by um, Igor Lindor et al. Uh, Neil McCluddy did the diatoms. Uh, a lot of the diatom data is hidden in supplemental data. That's because it was a whole bunch of different proxies on Lake Hazen. But again, here is what we see. And we're starting to see the same pattern in different types of lakes. Back in the 1800s, when it was significantly still colder, there is diatoms are beautifully preserved, but there's so few. And again, this is exactly what we would have predicted uh, with extensive ice cover, especially in a large lake where the littoral zone, that little moat of a littoral zone, is far from the center of a lake. Then once you get into the 1900s, you get these small benthic, small benthic fragileroids, typical that we still find in some totally, almost totally ice covered lakes, but they're harder to find now. They were easy to find 30 years ago. Then the lake started completely opening up in the 1990s. And sure enough, what do we see? Again, the same type very much later than the other lakes, but these striking changes in the discostellas happening at that time. So to put this on a graphic, uh, back here, diatom scared, but very well preserved. We're still talking about a, a lake that's asleep almost, extensively ice covered. Uh, then it starts opening up. The moat is getting bigger. We're getting more and more significant numbers of these small benthic fragileroids. And then this threshold type response when we're losing the ice cover, and we're now getting uh, the cyclotellas and other planktonic diatoms. So the classic response, even in this lake that's that's deep, enormous, even they have now become vulnerable uh, to recent warming. Now, when we published this, we published this in Nature Communications 2018, the questions came up saying, wait a second, wait a second, uh, Lake Hazen is famous for getting glacial input. There's this big Hazen glacier. Uh, what you're showing is simply a response to possibly nutrients or nitrogen coming in from the glacier. Uh, now we had nutrient data and I think we could argue it using water chemistry, but um, the argument was that you don't know this is ice cover. That could be because with warming, you're getting uh, the glacier moving. Well, there's not many advantages to being really old like me, <laughs> but, but one of them is you've taken cores or you have access to cores going back in time. So this was published Nature Communication. When some of those challenges came up, Neil McLeody, uh went and reanalyzed, uh, along with colleagues uh, who co-authored this paper, analyzed quarries that were taken before the glacier started melting. So it is such a big glacier, and it's well-studied glacier. It was only in 2007 that the glaciers shifted from mass gain to mass loss. I mean, that's how much inertia these glaciers had with a tenfold increase in meltwater. So it's only in 20, 2007 when it went from becoming a bigger glacier to releasing. I have access, well, we had access to two cores that were collected before 2007. Now these were collected after, two, so we looked at many cores, as you can see, we collected one in, uh, one in uh, we collected cores in 2017, 2013, uh, uh, these are 2013, these both are 2017, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, but these are, of course, collected before the change in glacial activity. And sure enough, you can see the this costella and that cyclotella change is happening well before. It is happening with the ice cover, not with the release of the glacier. So I think with, uh, this, again, was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 2020. And so again, what we're getting, we've calling this in the four conditions. Uh, this is reviewed in, uh, again, in chapter four of the, of the new book. Uh, Katie Griffiths also had a paper in plus one where we talked about some of these conditions, but I sort of try and pull it together with all of them uh, into, the, into this chapter four. If you're talking about these large lakes, if it's really cold with this extensive, extensive ice cover, there's almost nothing. Occasionally, they're still beautifully preserved benthic little fragileroids, but there's so few of them, it's almost impossible to count. And again, that's because the only place that's available is this very shallow moat and the lake bottom is far away where you take your sediment core. Condition one, it starts warming. The moat is opening, the benthos is getting more, uh, more available, large numbers of these small fragileroids. You continue warming, you get a far more diverse littoral zone. Now you've got mosses growing, you've got moss epiphytes, you've got diatoms growing on top of stalks and stuff, just like we showed at Cape Herschel. You get what we call condition two, and eventually you lose the ice cover and you get the plankton coming in, condition three. Okay, so that's in Hazen. What about going a little farther south? Let's take it to the next Great Lake, Great Bear. Very different limnology, no glaciers in this one, very different situation. I'm gonna take you to Great Bear, it's up here, and it's a very big lake again. I mean, these are these are really great lakes. They're 446 meters, massive, uh, very, very essentially distilled water, almost unmeasurable phosphorus and so on and so forth. Secchi depth of 30 meters. Uh, the textbooks call it cold monomictic because it, that's what little data we had. We now know since 2012, it's starting to stratify. So we are now capturing it, the shift from a cold monomic, not just losing ice cover, which is, well documented, but a shift to that. And I'm gonna show you a multiple of cores we took. Again, this is work of Kathleen Ruland, but again, we have some historical data. Some of it is kind of interesting. Uh, John Richardson, he was the naturalist on the John Franklin expedition in 1828. He, he beat Secchi in taking a Secchi reading. He put a white rag and he lowered it on a weight. And it, he said it descended to a depth of 15 fathoms which is 27 meters. So here we have perhaps, perhaps the earliest Secchi disc reading. Uh, it's basically a white rag by this military expedition. Uh, this is remarkably similar to the current measurements. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this was taken 40 years before Secchi actually invented the Secchi disc. It's remarkably similar to a study in 1945 of 29 meters and to the 1975 study saying 30 meters. So we actually have some historical data on this. The, there was one scientific study done by Miller in 1947. They were looking to see if this could be this lake could be available for fisheries. And it was the first biological survey. And what he found is exactly, he, these are things we're gonna be able to ground truth our paleo data with. Uh, he found e exceedingly meager plankton. Again, not surprising given the year, 1940s. Uh, extremely low productivity. Open water is almost a biological desert. Uh, and it concluded you can't have a fishery up here. But what are the diatoms? We have multiple cores. I'm showing you one, but we have multiple cores for all these sites. Look at this. Here is a core, same type of changes. Now this is Great Bear Lake. Now there's the Miller survey. Uh, we can use that to ground truth. We can show uh, that we basically, the reason he was finding nothing because almost all the algae were still benthic. Uh, we were in that condition where there was with the, still the long winter ice cover lasting into the summer. There wasn't really time for much of a plankton to produce. I mean, there was some plankton, but but it was minuscule, just like we basically ground to what Miller showed. Uh, Miller lets us ground to the paleo data, what he showed in 1945. However, what's happened since 1990, when again, the ice cover was greatly decreasing? Again, the increase in plankton was showing the same type of change. We have this in multiple cores. Uh, you know, I'll just, these are just the dis, the cyclotellas, uh, centolata increasing multiple. They're from different depths, different parts. Like this is sedimentary chlorophyll A. That also, not surprisingly, with less ice cover, you're getting more production. Uh, remote scenting shows us the same thing. It matches the paleo data. But basically, here we go again. We have the same, an extreme lake, but the same type of things. In the back in the 1800s, 
still very cold, little ice age type conditions. Diatoms beautifully preserved, but there's so few, these little fragile aeroids. Uh, as it starts to warm, you have these benthic diatoms prevail, these little fragile aeroids. And then post-1990, with this big warming that's happening in this part of the world post-1990, we again get these planktonic diatoms coming in. We actually, in this part of the world, we actually have uh, ice cover data going back uh, 40 years. We have wind. We have, of course, temperature meteorological data. And it all matches beautifully. Uh, we're having increasing ice-free season a month. We have a month more of ice-free season. That's remarkable for this part of the world. Wind is declining, uh, and air, which will also um, help stratification, which is what we've seen uh, now happening in the last 10 years. Air temperatures, 5.5 degrees. So these are really amplified, and that matches the cyclotelosum and the decline in the benthos, which you'd expect. Again, we have, it's not just paleo limnology, we have local observations, we have monitoring data and showing that it's now thermal stratification. And we also have remote sensing going back since 2003, all matching the paleo data. Then finally, my last example, the one we know most about is Great Slave Lake. Again, multiple cores, Great Slave Lake going now into the subarctic. It is the deepest lake in North America. Uh, most people aren't aware of that. They think it's one of the Great Lakes. It's the largest lake in the world. But look at this massive depth, depth 614 meters. Again, we have multiple cores. We have cores from 2014, and we have cores from 1994. Those 1994 cores are going to be interesting to look at because that predates the warming, the quick warming. So we would argue the 2014 cores should have the cyclotella change these cores before the great change in ice cover and warming should not. And that's actually what we're going to show you. Now, we do have good historical data, relatively good historical data, mainly by Donald Rawson, who at least the Canadians would know, I think most limnologists would know. He was at the University of Saskatchewan, and he led detailed studies on Great Slave Lake, again, to try and determine if it could support a fishery going back uh, in the 1940s. So again, we can ground truth our data. He has plankton collections. He has water chemistry, as well as then later after Rawson, we have Fee doing a detailed phycological study in 1983 and Evans doing a detailed phycological study in 1994. So we can ground tooth our paleo record with that. Again, starting to look familiar. Uh, there it is. Post 1990s, these big changes. This is when Rawson was here. We have his surveys. What did he find? He found the same diatoms that we have in the paleo, in the in the core. Uh, he didn't find any of these uh, discostellas or these planktonic taxa. This is what he found. Uh, then 1994, 1983 survey, same thing. Uh, these he has these olacosiras and so forth. Doesn't have the just a trace of these cyclotellas coming in in, in 1983. Evans 1994, same thing. We took the. Kathleen also took, looked at the cores in 1994, never mind the psychological survey. Uh, again, we're still dealing with these Alakasira and the, these other taxa. What did we find? Well, matching Rawson, we have uh, basically, again, diatom scarce in the really old sediment. Uh, warming, we see uh, this Alakasira increase, just like Rawson did in the 1940s. Bring it up to the Fiatal, well, he, he was still only finding Alakasiras, uh, the same taxa we have in the sediment core. Uh, what happened to Evans in 1994, still all the Alakasira, getting a hint of these cyclotellas. And then the most recent paleo study, again, we have the cyclotellas and the Asternella and Fragilaria tenera, the same tax that we find in these other ultra oligotrophic lakes uh, increasing or oligotrophic lakes increasing with warming in this part of the world. So again, we can ground truth it because, you know, we can go and take the cores in 1994 and say they weren't there yet. This has all happened since 1994. And again, the familiar diagram, you know it well by now, I'm sure. Uh, same type of pattern. We're seeing the same types of pattern going uh, through this lake, uh, through system. And again, we have meteorological and other data, some of it going back further. We have ice cover going back 53 years, another three weeks of ice free. We have wind going back 62 years. Look at the wind declining. Temperatures increasing 5.5 degrees in winter. And again, this is matching the cyclotella story. And again, Going back to this figure, uh, we're seeing going from uh, condition zero all the way to condition three in these lakes uh, based on this changing ice cover. So in conclusion, um, 
the Canadian Northern Great Lakes have changed drastically over the last few decades. They are functionally very different types of ecosystems. The sheer size and depth of these lakes resulted in prolonged ice coverage, delayed the warming, but similar to small and medium sized lake, the timing is different, but marked declines in ice cover and or increased stratification have led to new physical states in these Northern Great Lakes. And although the three lakes differ substantially in latitude and properties like nutrients and so on and so forth, uh, recent warming has triggered these regime shifts in these lakes. Now, the next question is, how will the rest of the food web be affected by these striking changes? Uh, Great Slave Lake, for example, supports a very significant indigenous fishery. Now, this is the, the fishery that was there in the 1930s. Uh, now it's a little more uh, sophisticated, um, but it's, uh, it, it supports an indigenous fishery. It supports a commercial fishery, and it supports a recreational fishery, which is important to the local economy. Will this be good or bad for these fisheries? It's very hard to tell. We're going from large diatoms to small diatoms. We're talking more algae. More algae might be good, increased production, but a shift to these smaller algae, they might have differences in, for example, the fatty acids and all the other things. So in any respect, uh, in conclusion, the, the Arctic Great Lakes are changing and changing very fast, and we're really not sure where that's going to. And uh, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, John, for a, a really powerful talk and um, dramatic examples of how um, ice influences um, diatom communities. And, and your work, in fact, in, influenced me very strongly in the 80s and, and working in the Antarctic and um, lakes under ice cover. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please, you can put them in the chat or even better, raise your hand and, um, and um, ask your question. Um, I was really interested to see the, the, the rag version because that came before this Seki that was, that was, um, Really need yeah. to see that. Yeah, K K Kathleen Ruland did a lot of uh, historical research on these lakes. Uh, you know, it, they're, they're bits and pieces in diaries and things. You know, the little things like you see, like the these early explorers, they walked onto the lake in you know, like June or July. We're not going to do that now. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, there's hints of what the ice was like even in those early, very early reports. That's yeah, cool. Adam, go ahead. Hey, John, that was a great talk. Um, love hear, learning more about the Northern Great Lakes. There was a paper out a couple of years ago showing Lake Superior was one of the fastest warming lakes on the planet at that time. I'm curious what the rate of change in some of these northern lakes are like now that they've lost that ice that you were talking about. It, I think it's tremendous. We don't have good. Now, there is some community monitoring on Great Slate. So Lake Hazen is very isolated. Uh, we're not going to get much, much data from there. Uh, Great Bear is as one tiny community on it. You know, these are quite isolated. Great Slave do does have community monitoring in the shallow areas. And I think that's really what we have to start looking at. Um, but uh, I think these are going to change even faster, I think, ecologically at least, than the Great Lakes. Because the Great Lakes, the Laurentian Great Lakes, are starting from a, a already a complex kind of assemblage. Uh, these are really, I mean, they're going from, you know, benthic to... Uh, to say, say Tycho planktonic Alacrosaira to these tiny little cyclotellus. And but overall production is increasing. I, I think they're I don't have really enough data to, to say that except my paleo, except our paleo data, but those changes are striking. And they're more striking, I think, than you and for example, shows you and Revy shows in the in the Great Lakes, which are striking enough. You know, <laughs> but these are the things. I think uh, a lot of our work asks more questions than answers them. And uh, people, we just published the Great Slave Lake paper three three weeks ago. I mean, we really was quite a lot of interview. Kathleen and I were doing interviews almost nonstop, um, partly just because it was we just had all the wildfires. You know, so, so now now the lakes are changing too, uh, but. It, I, I'm more concerned, you know, I'm concerned about lots of things, but um, how that's going to change the food web is really, uh, I'm not even sure we have anywhere nearly enough data to figure that one out. Uh, and then maybe there'll be winners and losers, you know, I mean, um, some will probably do better. There'd be prob there is more algae. Our data, chlorophyll A data shows that. The remote sensing shows chlorophyll A is increasing. Makes sense, longer summer. But the type of algae, 
uh, in the shallow areas, they've already seen some blue-green algal blooms, a center bacteria blooms, uh, in the very shallow part of one area. And again, you know, the summers there are getting quite a bit warmer. Those shallow areas are probably stratifying and warming up really fast. You know, these are in the, in the bays, for example. The Arctic is changing, changing so quickly. Um, and it's, it's strange to have been there for 40 years because I have the paleo data, but, you know, I actually have my eyes and my very detailed photographs and it has changed so, so quickly and dangerously fast. Yeah, we have some more questions in the in the chat, John. Um, Tom hey. asks, mm -hmm. are any of the diatoms, oh, there's Tom, you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. I, I forgot <laughs> first, uh, a great talk. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and also seeing how, you know, we've shown some of those small ponds, uh, you know, it was important to you know to, to pick some I guess without that were without out of the shadows of, of some of the local stuff. So um, and and again, how deep were these? How deep were these real shallow ponds? Some are very shallow. Now I should I should say more about the Cape Rufo ponds. Um, uh, for one thing, they're not thermocarst ponds. They're not permafrost ponds. They're excavated in granite. So think of them as bathtubs. <laughs> uh, they, they were perfect for this uh, in some ways because. We've done quite a bit of the chapter five or six is on the thermocarst pods or the permafrost pods, but these are were excavated in granite. So they think of them like bathtubs in the Arctic. Uh, and so that was one factor. They were shallow. And when we immediately, our first thought is, are they coreable? Are they datable? Um, and it the thing is that because we worried about cryoturbation, never mind all the other aspects, uh, we uh, the fact, first of all, I think the fact you have such striking, almost 100% changes in like a centimeter of sediment suggests you're not getting much blending, uh, much mixing. But there was a, we 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 go through in our papers through a series of tests to say that they're, they're not they're not mixed. One which uh, I'll just show you as an example. Um, Wes Blake took uh, piston cores from these ponds uh, uh, from uh, back uh, in the late 1970s. You can still fly over these ponds and see the hole. Now, I would have thought, you know, if you had cryoturbation, but the thing is we watched them, we, you know, Marianne Douglas and I watched these ponds thaw, we watched them freeze. They they get this ice cover and they just freeze quite quickly. They're almost like quick freezing, they're so shallow. You know, they're less than a meter deep, most of them. Now, Ellison Lake is a little deeper, you know, it, which is still technically a pond. We define a pond as anything that freezes to the bottom. So anything less than about three, four meters up there is a pond. But um, we really t had various ways of showing that in fact, they're not mixed. They're surprisingly uh, well, uh, uh, well stratified sediments. And they date fine, you know, lead to 10 and, uh, and again, I think one of the key things, if you have such striking changes um, in s such a short thing, you know, you, you, if you'd you see blending, not uh, not these big changes. Uh, sure. I, I, I had a real quick question. Did, were there any uh, sea or ice specialized uh, benthic taxa uh, uh, that, that disappeared in the, in the recent uh, sediments? Yeah. So in, in ponds, you know, I've always wondered about that. Um, I, I don't know, you know, as, as opposed to the sea, who are we, ocean, where we have all these ice diatoms. Um, in, in the freshwater world, there's some Alekosiras, of course, that like to live, uh, you know, um, uh, under, uh, you know, associated with ice. But we didn't in the pond see anything that we could identify as being an, an ice, ice diatom. So these these lakes freeze right to the bottom and they, they, they thaw in, well, now they're thawing in May. They used to thaw in July. <laughs> I mean that's how big a change I've seen, um, and and they they thaw and they just refill and very quickly they're full of diatoms, so they're coming they're they have a very effective resting stages yeah. Yeah, another question, uh, Miriam um, says wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's fascinating to see how communities in multiple lakes follow a similar progression. Do you ever see examples in the Arctic of patterns repeating themselves? For example, going from benthic to planktonic, then benthic uh, to planktonic again, or do they all generally show the same trend of pro progressing to the planktonic state? One, some area, if we have long enough cores, now, but one problem with the ponds, not problem, but there, uh, they were under the, you know, the, uh, because of isostatic uplift, many of these ponds are 
well, these are 4,000, 5,000 years old. Kalpan may be 8,000 years old. We don't go back very all the way back to the Ice Age because they were uh, because of isostatic uplift. Uh, we have uh, had uh, where we have seen a little bit of that is uh, some of the core, some of the full cores from the uh, from the lakes on, say, Pym Island, where uh, early Holocene warmings has some of these taxa, but is very very subtle. Uh, and then it goes back to sort of like the benthic when it was really cold, uh, it got colder, and then we see the change at the top. But we haven't really seen a site uh, that I know of yet that in recent time that went warm, cold, warm, cold, uh, based on the at least the resolution we have in the diatom record, uh, we see it, it once it starts going, it's going now. And also there is some inertia in the biological record. Uh, once you've got mosses, it takes, it's a threat, you know, we have threshold, no ice, ice, you know, it's a threshold. Stratification, no stratification. That's kind of a threshold. There are other biological thresholds and that's like mosses, no mosses. So for a long time, too cold, you know, too much scraping, no mosses. Then once the mosses are established, you could have one or two cold years, but the mosses would still be there. They'd survive. And so you'd still have moss epiphytes. So I'd, I'm not sure if it was a one year cold event, if you'd see that immediately, you'd see some of it, but it was uh, there, there's some biological inertia. I don't know what a better word I can use, or memory, let's say, uh, that would persist, I think, in, in the habitat record, at least. Yeah. Miriam, did that get your, your question? Um, feel free to add more. She said, thank you. Um, so, we're coming up on the top of the hour and and I know people have other commitments. So um, I'd just like to thank you again, John, for a really um, excellent presentation. Um, so much happening and now so much happening so fast. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, thank you. It's, it's great to see you and thank you everyone for joining and we'll see you again in two weeks.